This time we're going to look at a smart battery tester by Mustool. This will test all types of rechargeable batteries, whether it's a, an AGM or a standard car battery or gel cell, deep cycle. It'll test them all. It'll test them for internal resistance, tell you whether the battery is good or whether it's on its way out or whether it needs to be replaced. This is quite the unit. I'm only going to scratch the surface because I've only got a couple different batteries to test, but I am going to test a battery as bad as well as a brand new one to show you the difference that it detects. I have another device to show you guys, and I promise this will be the last one for at least for a little while. Uh, I got this one, got it from Banggood. They want me to show off this smart battery tester, and um, well, I don't really know much about it other than it tests batteries, so let's open it up. This is the IR502. Our specifications on here is it will test 12 and 24 volt starter lead acid batteries. Great, I can't test one. Actually, I can. You know what? My son's car is here. We can take it out and test his battery. And because he's got a brand new battery, it's going to pass because uh, his car is here. Um, but it'll do internal resistance measurement, discharge current battery life, battery level detections, start capability, battery quality, uh, lighting and flashlights, temperature measurements, uh, well, the upgraded version, well, I don't know if this is uh, car starting test, charging capabilities, if this is an upgraded one, uh, which I don't know, but here's what it will test. It's got, it's, it's a four terminal Kelvin connectors, or connections. It'll test standard AGM gel, EFB, um, EN, IEC, CCA, SAE, and DIN batteries, and um, backlight overload protection, reverse input protection. That's the specs. Let's open it up and see what's in the box. Comes in a nice little carry case. These are good for car enthusiasts that want to test their battery tell if their batteries are any good. I got a couple of gel cells here which are questionable. Uh, they were taken out of service so I, I would imagine that they are probably nobody good. But uh, let's just get the meter out here. And it says remove. Please tear off this protective film before use. Yes. Let's tear it off. There. Alright. Oh, it actually has a it, it has a battery in it. I guess you charge it up with USB-C like everything else. Here is the battery test clip. It uh, goes on to this using a nine-pin standard serial type connector. We don't see these too much these days, do we? Only on old computers. All right. Auto range. Here's our test clips. I've got um, I got a gel cell here. Let's say this one here, the warranty expiry date was 2015. This was taken out of service because it is no good. So this should tell me that this battery is is no good. Oh, I hope it would. Actually, I don't know what shape the battery in. It was taken out of service. I know that. But it probably will hold a charge. 12.9 volts is what it's saying. And... Uh, Internal resistance is 33.9. Auto range. Okay, mode. Set. I don't even know how to set off. Set. Okay. I probably should read the instructions to figure this out. Range. 12.9 volts. And maybe I'll read the manual. All right, just reading the instructions. This puts an AC... 1 kilohertz AC low resistance measurement uh, signal to the battery to measure the internal resistance. That's why we're seeing this. So it's not just measuring the voltage, it's actually measuring the internal resistance. And we can measure, uh, we can measure also lithium ion batteries as well with this thing here. It'll uh, actually it'll take uh, voltage up to 120 volts DC, not AC, although it'll blow the meter up. But so you can measure if you've got larger batteries like for like a solar setup, for example, if you've got a 96 volt battery string, you can measure that. And anything up to 120 volts can be measured with this, with the test clips. So it's all, it's pre-calibrated. So I don't need to do anything. You can calibrate it yourself if you want using test resistors, but it is pre-calibrated. So I'm going to leave it with its setting and we're just going to measure this. So this, this battery here is showing that it's got 33, 12.9 volts as the power this one's putting out 
right now 33.9 is the internal resistance and we go to the other battery and we'll just measure this other one here and see what shape this one here is in and as you can see this battery is 26 ohms internal resistance and it's putting out 13 volts so this one is a little better shape or, or at least it has a higher state of charge than this other one now if we want to get fancy we put the two batteries in series and put a jumper on it it will measure this is interesting here because it's now showing my internal resistance 637 ohms 25.23 volts get one battery 13 volts internal resistance 18 point 20 or 26 ohms and two batteries 637 did this one have much higher maybe this one had a much higher internal resistance these only got 33 ohms as well interesting okay uh, let's measure I got a lithium cell here somewhere let's just measure this one negative terminal I don't know whether there's any charge in this one or not we're going to find out pretty quick is this battery any good I have some here that are, that are dead so this might be one of them there we go so 3.1, 3.15, the internal resistance on this one is, uh, it's figuring it out here, 96 ohms. We have another pack that I can measure here. This one is a, um, this is a nickel metal hydrate pack. It's got a clip on the end here, which we can remove. I don't know whether there's a charge in this or not. There should be. This came out of an old dead alarm panel that was taken out of service. And as far as I know, the battery was still was still holding a charge when it was removed. So this should have 7.2 volts on it. Seven point six internal resistance eighty seven nope three hundred and sixty ohms seven point five volts and I guess we can select the different settings on here. has a built-in flashlight as well press and hold this key and it'll turn on the LED so if you're working in the dark you can see what you're doing okay, I just selected the filter mode on here and it's telling me this battery is bad the instructions are not um, are not real comprehensive as to how to operate it, it just says just connect the battery and it will tell you whether it's any good or not it supposedly does this all automatically it's telling me that this battery is is also bad right it's lighting up bad we're going to take this out and we're going to put it on the car battery on the, the new car battery that I just got and it should say that this is good so let me grab the other camera we're going to take it outside and hook it up to the battery uh, a brand new battery because I know these batteries are old I would expect them to show as bad because they were taken out of service because they were bad these were UPS batteries so I would expect these to show as bad because well they're bad but let's hook it up to a new battery and see what it looks like and you see this is what a new battery looks like it says perfect the internal resistance 
0 0.04 ohms. So that is uh, what a new battery does. So those other two batteries that were taken out of service because, well, they were indicated as being bad, they're bad. It's telling me they're bad. I knew they were bad, and the meter told me they're bad, and it's telling me that this one is absolutely perfect. So we're back in the, the shop. Turn this one off. We'll uh, pop this apart quickly and just take a look at it and see what's inside because that's what we do. Uh, on the back here there's a battery hatch for the internal lithium battery which I guess is replaceable. So there is an internal lithium battery here that plugs in. We'll pop the screws out, take a look at the uh, circuitry on this one and then we will end it and I'll put a link in the description. This one was made by Must Tool. If I didn't mention that already, this is a Must Tool battery tester. I'm going to try to do this without disconnecting the internal battery because I don't know whether it loses calibration or not when it's disconnected. So if I can open this up and just leave that internal battery connected, we might be just better off. Uh, this is this is open. actually a fair bit in here when you think about what it exactly is it is it's just a battery tester this has got quite a few chips in it there's the internals there's a lot more going on in here than meets the eye and this has more chips and a lot of dmms it's got uh well first of all it's going to have the the circuitry to generate the one kilohertz tone for measuring the internal resistance Got a couple of Rubicon caps in here. That speaks quality right there. But uh, looking at the circuit board, this looks to be well put together. Surface mounted chips. That's for a light. There's a light behind these keys so you can see them in the dark. There's an LED there for that. Is that a custom IC? There's no number on that IC. You know that? There's no number on here. Either they've washed it off or it's not ground down. But there's no number on that IC. Well, they've milled them down. All of them have been milled down. Look at this one. See, they've milled these ICs down. So obviously they're protecting their design. That one doesn't seem to have a number. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's got no sign of obvious milling it down, but these ones have been milled down. You can see these have all been milled down. So this is just, again, another way the companies protect their intellectual property as they don't want another company coming along and basically stealing their design and making a copy. So what many companies do, and this has been going on for years, is they remove the numbers. Now, I'll tell you a quick story. Back in the early 80s, when home video was first hitting the, the, the stores, the, the rental markets, uh, people were copying tapes. They are getting two VCRs and hooking them together and making a copy of the tape. So the, the studios fought back by putting in copy guard on the, uh, on the movies to stop people from, from copying tapes. And of course, as soon as they started that, others came along and figured out ways to prevent or to block the uh, the copy guard signal. The original one was not macrovision. The original signal was uh, a, a form of just sync suppression. And all you needed was just a basic sync generator and you could uh, lock onto the vertical signal and or not even a sync generator, just a transistor array is all that was required. And you just locked onto the incoming signal and um, regenerated the missing vertical sync. And everybody was making these things in high school. It, it had a little one little part in it called a transistor array, which was basically, I think it was just five transistors in a little um, 
16 pin uh, dip. Anyway, um, there was guys that were making these things. A lot of them were in high school. I was one of them. We were making these uh, copy guard busters that you just took between your two VCRs and it would remove the copy guard. It had a vertical hold control and you just adjusted the control and it would it would remove the, uh, the, the copy guard. And again, it wasn't macrovision. It was just a suppressed sink. And um, you were off to the races. You could, you could copy movies. And these things, we sold them for a hundred bucks easily. A hundred bucks we could get for these things every day. I could sell 10 of them a week. All my friends wanted them, you know, so they could copy movies. The two VCRs put them together and Bob's your uncle. This is before Macrovision. Macrovision made things a little more difficult because it encoded the signal, it encoded uh, the actual video. The original one, they just basically removed 80% of the vertical sync and there was enough for TVs that had a vertical hole control to lock on, but uh, uh, TVs that didn't have a vertical hole control had a little more, more trouble. But uh, anyway, it costs us less than $5 in parts to build these copy guard busters. It wasn't macrovision, it was, say, just suppressed sink. It was a transistor array, um, 50k pot, and a few resistors, and a couple capacitors, and that was about it. Pretty, pretty simple to do. Any high school kid could do this thing, and we were. <laughs> we were selling these things. We were selling them like they were going out of style. And we didn't want others copying the design that we got out of a magazine at the time. So what we did was uh, just take some sandpaper, sand off that one IC. We didn't care about the transistors. There was a couple transistors in there as well. We didn't care about that. All we wanted to do was protect our little business of making copy guard busters. Because uh, we were building them on bread, little breadboards. I mean, they were so simple to make these things. It was ridiculous how simple these, these units were. Um, and I think I probably, uh, I was probably making about uh, 20 of them a week, selling them to all my friends at 100 bucks a piece. I, I kid you not. I mean, it was like, it was like Christmas. It came apart easier than it going back together. Anyway, um, so that was, we were doing that back in like, you know, 1980, 81. And, and then of course the, the fun was taken out of it when this new, copy protection scheme was developed called Macrovision. That was a little more challenging to to beat. We did beat it. We did beat it. There was plans printed in radio electronics as well as other publications at the time, but unfortunately our days were numbered with that because, well, Hollywood took it to court. And they won this time. They didn't win in other cases, but this time they won. And um, it became illegal to produce and sell and probably even possess. So then other companies came out with, because they disrupted televisions as well when they were, when they were just playing a movie, they would disrupt certain TVs. So companies came out with devices that would sort of remove it, but not 100%. They couldn't kill 100% of the signal. They had to leave a portion of it behind so that VCRs could detect it. And all the ones that you saw that were selling for 30 bucks and stuff near the end, the Curtis video stabilizers and all those ones, they were based on the accepted version, which didn't remove 100% of the signal but they removed enough of it so that a TV could display it. But they didn't remove enough of it in many cases. Older VCRs worked fine, but the newer VCRs, um, they had a real problem with it. Because they all had a chip in them that would detect the little bit of macrovision that was left behind. Uh, that didn't go together very well, did it? I guess I'll have to uh, do this again off camera. Anyway, links in the description. Thanks for watching.